Today's story begins with a prophecy. Legend has it that there was a wealthy and generous businessman who, in his lifetime, did many good deeds. After he passed away, he was brought into heaven. When he met God, God told him, I can prepare a room for you in heaven, and you can live in it for a thousand years. What kind of room would you like it to be? After some thought, the wealthy man said, Then please give me the most luxurious and spacious room. I would like to be able to see the most beautiful scenery in the world from the room, along with the best food. God fulfilled the wealthy man's request. A thousand years passed in the blink of an eye, and the wealthy man was brought before God once again. This time, as soon as he saw God, he burst into tears and exclaimed, This is not heaven at all, it's worse than hell. It turned out that in the room the wealthy man requested, there were only luxurious material possessions, but there was no one else for a thousand years. If you find it difficult to understand the moral of this story, the series of experiments I am about to share may provide you with some insights. In the 1950s to the 1960s, American psychologist Harry Hullow and his colleagues conducted a series of brutal experiments on rhesus monkeys. These experiments were undoubtedly extremely cruel to the animals, but Hollow's experiments later saved countless families and were even regarded as one of the greatest psychological experiments of the 20th century. Harry Hullow was born in 1905, and while he might not be as well known, one of his students, Abraham Maslow, is familiar to anyone with an interest in psychology for his development of the hierarchy of needs theory. In the 1930s and 1940s, the founder of American behaviorist psychology, John Watson, proposed a famous theory that a child's need for love stems from their need for food. According to this theory, a mother's love is sufficient as long as she provides enough food. If a mother becomes too affectionate with her children, it could even affect their growth. All children should be treated like machines and be trained, corrected, and molded. One of the most famous quotes from John Watson is, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and, yes, even beggar man and thief. The cruel little Albert experiment was conducted under Watson's guidance, and his theory was once widely popular in the United States, influencing various Western countries and even reaching Asia. Concepts like the cry it out method, delayed gratification, and the infant independent sleep method all originated from Watson's theory. To this day, many parents still firmly believe in Watson's cry it out method. In the early 1950s, behavior psychologists liked to use terms like stimulus, response, and compliance, but Harry Hollow liked to talk about love. One day, during an academic seminar, when Hollow repeatedly mentioned the word love, another psychologist kept interrupting him, asking, is the love you're talking about simply about physical closeness? Finally, Hollow, unable to tolerate it any longer, retorted, perhaps the love you understand is just about physical closeness. But thank God, I'm not as stupid as you. That was typical of Harry Hollow's style, he spoke directly and was the first to stand up against John Watson's theory. Harry Hollow's first experiment on rhesus monkeys, known as the surrogate mother experiment, involved taking newborn infant monkeys and placing them in isolated cages for rearing. Each cage had two surrogate mothers to replace their real mothers. One surrogate mother was made of wire and had a bottle attached to her chest, providing milk 24 hours a day. The other surrogate mother was made of soft cloth, offering a warm and comforting touch, but without a bottle. According to John Watson's theory that having milk is all that matters, the wire mother with a bottle attached should have been more appealing. However, the experimental results showed that all the infant monkeys preferred to stay close to the cloth mother. They would only go to the wire mother to drink milk when they were starving, and immediately returned to the cloth mother afterward. Hullo later escalated the experiment by introducing a robot that produced terrifying banging noises into the cages to observe how the infant monkeys would react to fear. As expected, when the infant monkeys saw the terrifying object in front of them, they all screamed and rushed into the comforting arms of the cloth mother. They continued to seek comfort and touch from the cloth mother until they eventually calmed down. Hullo then placed the infant monkeys in a room filled with various toys, but like all newborns, they were filled with fear in an unfamiliar environment. Even if the room contained the wire mother, the infant monkeys remained scared, huddling in the corners in search of safety. Hollow then switched the wire mother to the cloth mother, and the infant monkeys immediately rushed to the cloth mother. After gaining a sense of security and enough confidence, the infant monkeys began to explore their surroundings and tried to interact with the toys in the room. It was clear that the infant monkeys who received maternal care were more courageous. 
Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory and his teacher Harry Hollow's experiments are closely related. The infant monkeys received food from the wire mother, satisfying their most basic physiological needs, while the cloth mother provided a higher level need for security and attachment. The main difference between the cloth mother and the wire mother was the softness of touch. Specifically, compared to the wire mother, the texture and warmth of the cloth mother resembled the monkey's fur more closely, which is why the infant monkeys were more willing to approach the cloth mother. Based on the maternal deprivation experiments, Hollow arrived at a very important conclusion. Love is derived from contact, not from food. The sense of security provided through physical contact is the most crucial element of maternal love. The essence of maternal love is not merely satisfying a child's hunger and thirst, but is centered on caring through physical touch, embracing, and intimacy. This is why skin-to-skin -skin contact, commonly referred to as kangaroo care, is promoted in many countries. Kangaroo care does not mean placing a baby in a literal pouch, but rather encouraging the baby to come into close contact with the mother's skin, providing the warmth and tranquility of the human body. Researchers once conducted long-term follow-up observations on 264 premature infants born between 1993 and 1996, weighing less than 1.8 kilograms. The premature infants who received kangaroo care had significantly lower mortality rates than the control group of premature infants kept in standard incubators. They also developed milder, less aggressive personalities and were less prone to impulsive behavior. Hollow's experiments with rhesus monkeys did not stop at maternal deprivation experiments, and the monkeys did not find relief so quickly. A few years after the surrogate mother experiments, Harry Hollow and his colleagues discovered a peculiar phenomenon. Regardless of whether the infant monkeys were raised by the cloth mother or the wire mother, they were unable to integrate into the monkey society as they grew up. They exhibited hostility towards their peers, and when companions tried to approach them, they even displayed significant aggressiveness. At this point, Hollow had another idea. He said that these monkeys couldn't even adapt to group living. So did they still possess the ability to reproduce and care for offspring? True to Hollow's expectations, the infant monkeys raised by surrogate mothers, whether male or female, lost interest in mating with the opposite sex. They were simply unwilling to mate. If normal male monkeys were introduced into the cages with the females for mating, the females resisted fiercely, leaving the males injured. At this point, Hollow introduced another inhumane invention, the ray prag, which was used to immobilize the female monkeys to allow the males to forcibly copulate. Although mating was technically successful, among the 20 female monkeys used in the experiment, seven completely ignored their offspring after cutting the umbilical cord, and eight often physically abused or even tortured their own offspring. Four were cruel enough to kill their own offspring, and only one female monkey reluctantly nursed her child. Hollow and his colleagues began to contemplate why this phenomenon occurred. Why were the infant monkeys raised through maternal deprivation unwilling to engage in mating? At this point, Hollow began to modify the surrogate mother, which was the cloth mother, by adding a swinging function to make it appear more realistic, like being in a cradle when we were infants. Thus, the cloth mother 2.0 version was introduced, and a new batch of infant monkeys was sent into the laboratory. In this experiment, Hollow and his colleagues ensured that the infant monkeys spent at least half an hour each day playing with the swinging cloth mother. The results of the experiment showed that the infant monkeys raised in this environment essentially grew up normally and did not reject the opposite sex. They also exhibited some social skills. Building upon this, Harry Hollow conducted a supplementary experiment. He placed a group of newborn infant monkeys in cages, preventing them from having any contact with other real mothers or surrogate mothers. After eight months, the infant monkeys were removed from isolation and placed back in the rooms with either the cloth mother or the wire mother. The results showed that these infants did not show any attachment to either mother. As they grew up, they exhibited extreme social isolation, shyness, and fear of other monkeys. When other members of their species tried to approach them, they displayed aggressiveness, even self-mutilation. Hollow found that if infant monkeys were separated from their mothers for over 90 days after birth, even if they were later reunited with their mothers, it was challenging for them to develop into normal monkeys. This was because a critical period was missed, and the resulting damage would be irreversible. On the other hand, if infant monkeys spent their early days with their mothers, and were later isolated for a period but then returned, they quickly recovered their social skills. Building upon the previous maternal deprivation experiments, Hollow further concluded that maternal love had three essential factors. Touch, movement, and play. The critical period for establishing emotional bonds is in the early days of a newborn. 
Once that window is missed, it is closed forever, resulting in lasting harm. For rhesus monkeys, this critical period is approximately 90 days, which translates to about six months for humans. This means that, right after birth, infants must avoid prolonged separation from parents, especially mothers. In 1958, Hollow was elected as the president of the American Psychological Association. He documented his findings in a paper titled The Nature of Love, in which he stated, Love consists of three basic elements, touch, movement, and play. If you provide these three elements, you meet all the needs of a primate. After understanding the nature of love, Holland began to ponder, what if parents provide not love but abuse to their children? How would the children react? To explore this question, Hollow designed another extremely cruel experiment called the Iron Maiden Experiment. The so-called Iron Maiden was, in fact, an evil toy surrogate mother. It occasionally emitted dull-headed iron spikes, blew cold air, and made strange noises, all of which terrified the infant monkeys. When the toy surrogate mother acted up, the infant monkeys would be scared, hiding in the corners of their cages, squeaking in fear. For the infant monkeys, these surrogate toy mothers were undoubtedly wicked mother figures. However, the experimental results were unexpected. Hollow found that, no matter how these toy surrogate mothers abused the infant monkeys, the monkeys would not leave. They would quietly stay in the corner when the surrogate mother acted up, maintaining a certain distance. When the abuse ended, the infant monkeys would immediately return to the surrogate mother's embrace, hugging her tightly. Hollow believed that once the attachment between parents and children was established, even if parents later treated their children cruelly, the children's attachment to their parents would not waver. They say maternal love is great, but isn't the love of children for their parents also a form of unconditional love? As the 1960s arrived, biopsychiatry gained prominence. Experts believed that mental illnesses could be alleviated or cured through medication. This piqued Hollow's interest, and he once again conducted experiments on rhesus monkeys. This time, it was one of his cruelest experiments, known as the Pit of Despair. Hollow created rows of funnel-shaped, black chambers in which a group of newborn infant monkeys were suspended head down. There was enough food at the bottom of the funnels, so the infant monkeys wouldn't starve. The funnel-shaped chambers resembled a well. Initially, the infant monkeys struggled desperately and tried to climb up. After realizing they couldn't escape, they gradually became quiet, sinking into deep despair. Hollow's purpose in doing this was to induce a state of severe depression in the infant monkeys in a short period, resembling human depression. In this way, newborn infant monkeys were suspended in the pit of despair for a full two years. After being released, as Hollow expected, they all suffered from severe depression. Hollow then began using medication to treat the monkeys' depression. But regardless of the type of medication or the various methods attempted, the results were minimal. The infant monkeys who had been suspended in the pit of despair during their early years exhibited various degrees of psychological issues as they grew up. They stayed away from the monkey group, often sitting there blankly, displaying self-isolation, self-mutilation, and strong aggressiveness. As a result, Hollow concluded that severe and prolonged social isolation during infancy could lead to lasting psychological damage, even death, in primates, and this impact would persist throughout their lives. In these infant monkeys, we seem to witness the most severe mental illnesses in humans. But how did the pit of despair come to be? For the infant monkeys, it was a situation of hopelessness and no escape. Babies can experience two types of negative emotions. The first is a feeling of despair, and the second is the development of hatred, wanting to destroy the whole world. I once saw a question on Facebook where the asker said, I've been subjected to cold violence from my parents. What should I do? One of the responses was very heart-wrenching. The responder said that during one summer vacation in fifth grade, because he didn't want to attend extra classes, he was subjected to cold violence from his mother. His mother didn't say a word to him for the entire summer vacation. He was so tormented that he even used his head to hit the wall. Finally, he wrote a letter to his mother, saying he knew he was wrong and was willing to attend extra classes. In the following years, his mother continued to use the same cold and violent methods to force him to do things he didn't want to do. Now he has graduated from graduate school, but he says he doesn't want to start a family because he knows his mental state is not very good and he doesn't want to harm others. In movies, we often see criminals being locked in a small, dark room for several consecutive days. This is the fastest and most effective way to break their psychological defenses. In a completely dark room with no response, no interaction with anyone, silence and despair will make you feel increasingly restless. Most people show symptoms of reduced concentration and depression in less than three days of isolation. 
Some people may even experience hallucinations and delusions. Now, let's return to the prophecy that was shared initially. The room the wealthy man asked from God, filled with various foods and the most beautiful scenery, but with no one else, is essentially a luxurious version of a small, dark room. In Freud's work, Three Essays on the Theory of Sexuality, there is a story about a three-year-old boy shouting in a dark room, saying, Auntie, talk to me. I'm afraid it's too dark here. The auntie responds, What's the use? You can't see me. The little boy says, It doesn't matter. Talking brings light. Response is light, and no response is a predicament. Before Hollow's experiments, most Americans follow John Watson's parenting advice, Don't show affection to your baby. Don't kiss them goodnight. The correct approach was to bend down, shake hands with your baby, and then turn off the lights and leave. But Harry Hollow said, don't shake hands with your children. Go over there and hug them. Parental responses and physical contact bring a sense of security, which is the most crucial element of love. They say time is the only standard to test the truth. John Watson's parenting style led to his three children experiencing varying degrees of depression as adults and attempting suicide multiple times. His eldest son tragically took his own life before the age of 30. It's undeniable that Harry Hollow's experiments were incredibly cruel to these baby monkeys, but the results of his experiments also changed the parenting views of countless families. Nowadays, parents often say a phrase in many countries, especially in Asia, don't let your children fall behind from the starting line. But the key to this starting line is not material. High quality companionship is the best gift parents can give their children. It's also the invisible starting line that many people overlook. All right, that's it for today. If you have any insight that would like to share, please leave comments below. If you want to continue supporting this channel, remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to ensure you don't miss any episodes. Lastly, if being radical is the new norm and objectivity is considered heretical, perhaps we should be radically objective. Until next time, stay curious and stay unconventional.